Hello everyone. Welcome back to the week six of NPTEL TA live interaction session. So by this week, we'll be covering half of the course uh, for the rapid manufacturing course, having course ID NOC 22 NE 74. This is Palkin Gupta, PhD scholar and a PMRF scholar in Department of Material Science and Engineering, IIT Kanpur. And the course instructors for this course are uh, Professor J. Ram Kumar and Professor Amandeep Singh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Kanpur. Okay, so uh, in this uh, week, uh, we have covered uh, various polymerization processes for additive manufacturing techniques and the powder based processes for the additive manufacturing techniques. So uh, various methods and strategies uh, were discussed during the week's lecture and uh, we'll be going uh, through the concepts and the working principles of different of these strategies uh, very briefly in this lecture and uh, then uh, through the uh, quest uh, some sample problems uh, from this week. Okay, so uh, let us begin with uh, the polymerization processes. So uh, what is a polymerization? In a very simple terms, if we say polymerization is a formation of uh, long range polymers or polymeric chains. So it uh, makes use of liquid or radiation curable resins or photopolymers as the primary materials. Okay, so it is either a liquid or a radiation curable resin, a resin that can be cured using resins, then photopolymers as the primary materials. Now this photopolymers is a pretty new term and we'll be discussing what is photopolymers. Now they are basically liquids or uh, resins uh, that, sorry for the typing error, uh, that react to the presence of radiations. So these liquids or resin, they react uh, whenever uh, they feel the presence of any kind of radiations. So uh, these radiations can be uh, either uh, UV light, visible light, gamma rays, etc. Now upon these radiations, whenever radiations falls on these uh, photopolymers, these materials, they undergo certain chemical reactions and solidifies, okay? And then they tend to form solids. So this is a schematic. This is a liquid polymer, a photopolymer, and then there is polymerization induced by light. So these uh, purple ones are the oligomers. They are one of the constituents of uh, the resin. Then these smaller ones are the monomers of, uh, that is, the smallest repetitive unit of uh, your uh, polymeric chain and then we have these greens as the photo initiators. Now these will actually undergo a, a chemical reaction when a UV light falls on them and initiate uh, the linking of oligomers and monomers to form long polymeric chains. Okay, so we can see that these oligomers and monomers have joined here to form long uh, polymeric chains. They have joined to form long polymeric chains. Now, what uh, kind of rays or radiations do these photopolymers require in order to undergo such a reaction so as to form the polymeric chains? So, they can be either gamma rays, they can be X-rays, electron beams, ultraviolet rays or visible light. Where these UV rays and visible light, these are the most commonly used radiations. Okay, these are the most commonly used radiations. Now, uh, we have seen different configurations of this VAT polymerization technique during the lecture series. So, three of the major uh, contents were considered. One was your vector scan approach. 
then was mass projection dmd approach and the last one was two photon approach so in the uh, vector scan approach the uh, laser scans in a point wise manner okay so suppose you have to print uh, this square a square cross section now your uh, laser will scan each and every point in a continuous fashion like this it will go from one point to the next point so what are the main uh, contents or, uh, or what is the main uh, way like vector scan approach so you have a laser first one is a laser which is a solid state laser usually which is used so you can say maybe helium cadmium or NDAC. So these are the different kinds of solid state lasers which are used. And why we use solid state lasers? As they are more stable in nature. These are more stable. Now uh, this laser goes through the required optics so that it is coherent and has similar kind of uh, no phase differences, similar wavelengths, etc. And then it finally interacts with the scanning galvanometers. Now, these scanning galvanometers are responsible for X and Y direction motion of this laser. Okay, so in X and Y direction, these scanning galvanometers direct the laser as to uh, what x coordinates you have to move what y coordinates you have to move and now this uh, optics this is used for focusing and adjusting the laser okay now uh, when we go to this vat tank or the resin tank here your resin is filled This platform, this is uh, responsible for the uh, Z direction movement. There is an elevator here, which is uh, responsible for moving the build platform in Z direction. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, the Z direction movement. So it is being able to move in all the three directions that is X, Y and Z. Uh, now uh, we have a recoder blade as well so as to recode the layer of the resin and ensure proper solidification. Now in the control system we have uh, different certain different components or uh, what are those? Control system major, majorly consists of a process controller that is your electronics that controls the entire process. The sensors, different kinds of sensors, there can be temperature sensors, motion sensors or the sensors that guide the limits of X and Y direction movements etc. Beam controller. This controls the intensity and the direction of the laser beam and environment controller. Okay, these are uh, the different control systems. Okay, now we have a micro vector scan, a micro polymerization vector scan as well. So, micro stereolithography. vector scan approach here uh, we can have five micrometer uv beam and which can go up to a resolution of 0.25 microns in x and y this is the least resolution that it can offer in x and y directions and a least resolution of one microns along Z direction.
this is the micro stereolithography vector scan approach okay so it gives a very good uh, accuracy and surface finish okay now we move on to mask projection approach in a uh, vector scan we used to move in a point wise manner but in mask projection approach an entire layer is uh, printed in one go okay so it projects bit maps bit maps onto a resin surface to cure an entire layer at a time okay so this cures an entire layer at a time now similarly you have a laser or a lamp then the controlling optic and then you have dmds in in spite of scanning galvanometers you have dmds which are digital micro mirror devices okay now uh, what their function is it is basically an array of multiple mirrors arranged on a platform what their function is as per the cross section that has to be projected onto the vat platform they turn on and off the mirrors so as to project a particular pattern so suppose you have to uh, project uh, one square or uh, say from this kind of a shape okay this is uh, what you want to project on your uh, vat or resin so now uh, what your mirror will do this is your dmd and it is having uh, sorry and it is uh, having an array of mirrors okay so suppose you have multiple mirrors okay now out of these mirrors only these many corresponding suppose this only these will project the light only these will allow the radiations to pass through them and rest of the mirrors will remain off so that no light passes through them and there is no solidification at the respective places in the vat okay so in this way an entire layer is uh, projected at one time and solidified or printed so it also has this platform and elevator mechanism or rest of the mechanism is more or less the same just uh, they have uh, the difference in a single point scan and an uh, area scan at a time now next technique we have is two photon a uh, vat polymerization okay uh, now in this uh, photo initiator uh, that basically initiates the polymerization requires two photons to strike it okay it uh, at least two uh, it says that uh, i require two photons at least that much should strike me before i start to decompose into radicals or cations so that uh, polymerization can be initiated okay so it requires two photons so that is why we have two lasers uh, which simultaneously projects photons onto a particular photo initiator molecule okay so uh, it greatly enhances the resolution it uh, greatly improves the resolution okay now it is only uh, near this uh, center of the laser only at uh, this point that uh, the irradiance or the intensity is high enough to provide photon density necessary to ensure that two photons strike the same photo initiator at the same time so uh, the spacing is kept such that that only in the very near vicinity of this point uh, is the irradiance or the photon density so high that uh, there is high chance of two photons striking the photo initiator molecule at once okay so irradiance should be maintained high and rest it also contains all that flat 
form, resin tank, etc. And those galvanometers, it is also uh, moved by scanning galvanometers. They are not shown here, but it makes use of scanning galvanometers to guide the laser. Okay. Now, these were the scanning approaches uh, that are majorly used in uh, these polymerization processes. Now, uh, let us come to what are the different types of UV curable photopolymers. Okay. So, there are linear chains, branched chains and cross-linked chains. So, linear chains means there is only one single long chain. Only one single long chain of polymer. Now we come to this uh, branched chain. In branched chain, small, branch, uh, small uh, chains come out from uh, one main chain. Okay, small polymeric chains. originate from one master polymeric chain okay and then we have cross-linked one in which uh, many long chains are joined together through branches and all. multiple chains are connected through branches okay so these uh, linear and branched chains they are uh, they melt and resolidify so they come under thermoplastic so these two they melt and resolidify so they come under the term thermo plastics but uh, this cross-linked one they it does once it solidifies is do not remelt do not remelt okay and uh, it has a uh, much uh, less creep and stress relaxations now uh, what are the main ingredients of these photopolymers so we have the photo initiators that are responsible for a formation of free radicals or cations. Okay, now we have reactive uh, dilutants. So the function of these is to lower down the viscosity. lower down the viscosity of the entire polymeric formulation then we have flexibilizers they impart flexibility to otherwise hard and rigid plastic polymers Okay, then we have stabilizers. They ensure the polymer isn't affected much by the ambient. To ensure that polymer remains unaffected by the ambient conditions. okay and then we have liquid monomers these are our main units this is the main ingredient that ultimately form the entire polymeric chains okay now we have these photo initiators these photo initiator 
whenever uv radiation strikes them they become reactive and then they react with the liquid monomer to give polymeric chain so how they become reactive by forming free radical or cations so that is how they become very reactive as they are in the free radical or cationic form they are highly susceptible to uh, join to any other molecule now we have two main types of photopolymeric chemistries one is free radical photopolymerization and the other is cationic photopolymerization so we have different kinds of photopolymers some are acrylate types and some are epoxy or vinyl ether type so the acrylate type majorly undergo the free radical kind of polymerization whereas the epoxy and vinyl ether uh, type they majorly undergo the cationic type of polymerization now uh, let us check out this polymerization process uh, very briefly so this pi is your photo initiator so this is your photo initiator now whenever a uv light or any radiation falls on it any kind of radiation so suppose any kind of radiation is striking it so it will decompose and form a free radical so this is basically a free radical now this free radical is highly susceptible to join with any other molecule and a uh, form another kind of free radical okay so this is highly unstable so uh, this uh, free radical is highly unstable so it tends to join with the monomeric molecule so it uh, tries to join with the monomer okay so once it joins with the monomer so it again create a free radical this is the initiation of your polymerization process now this is again a free radical molecule and this again is uh, susceptible to uh, form a compound or another chain so this again joins with another monomeric molecule and in such a way that they start to form long chains this is the propagation of polymerization now so this has to terminate somewhere else it will the process can go on and on and on so two free radicals can join together to terminate it okay so two free radicals can join together to terminate the polymerization process okay so it can be either two of these type of molecules or one of this type and the other of this type or one of this and the other of this type so these can club together to form the final polymeric chain which will look like this this m is your monomer okay so now in cationic this was for free radical polymerization in cationic polymerization the concept remains the same only difference is that instead of these free radicals cations are generated so your this pi okay, your pi will form i positive now this i positive plus this this will take one negative charge from this and this 
itself becomes this positive so in such a way this cationic polymerization propagates and then finally terminates okay now now we come to resin formulations and uh, reaction mechanisms so these uh, monomers uh, they are majorly made of polyacrylate and they have undergo cross linking polymerization whereas these oligomers uh, which are uh, certain few repetitive units of the uh, uh, monomers they are epoxy acrylates urethane acrylates or amino acrylates and many more okay or they can be polyols epoxides acrylic acids their esters etc the list is long so now what is a resin it is a mix of different kinds of photo initiators photo sensitizers monomers oligomers and other ingredients that help in the stabilization of the resin anything that helps towards stabilizing the resin is added to it. Okay, now oh, what is a photo initiator system? It basically converts the physical energy of the incident light into the chemical energy in the form of reactive intermediates. What are those reactive intermediates? These are those uh, free radical and cationic species during the polymerization process. Formed during polymerization okay now uh, it's the physical energy of the incident light that is the photons they are transformed into chemical energies because a certain chemical reaction is going on in the system and that uh, when that chemical reaction takes place they change into some reactive intermediates now there is a strong strong absorption of these photons by the resins at the laser emission wavelength we have a certain wavelength set that these kind of photopolymers will absorb this wavelength of photons okay so at that particular point the absorption is really high then we have photolysis which is basically the initiating species what is photolysis it is a very fast process and it consists of photo plus lysis. So photo means photons and lysis means breaking off. So breaking off due to photons. This is photolysis. Now what are the different kinds of uh, monomers that uh, are used? They are usually patented by the manufacturers and entire information is never given so these acrylates they form the radical photopolymers whereas epoxies and along with vinyl ether they are the cationic type of photopolymers so these are the different structures of uh, the photopolymers so we can say acrylates uh, have a particular structure and epoxies and vinyl ether have a different kind of structure Hence, they undergo different kinds of photopolymerization reactions. Now, uh, this was all about uh, your uh, polymerization uh, processes. Next, what we had gone through during the lectures in the week uh, were the powder-based processes. We have discussed selective laser sintering, selective laser melting, and different kinds of fusion mechanisms and their applications. So, uh, we will be going through them uh, briefly. Okay, so let us uh, first go through uh, the schematics and the working principles of uh, this uh, selective laser uh, sintering. So, what is the name suggest? Selective laser sintering. This is so. By the name itself, we can say that it means centering of the powder in a selective manner using the laser. Centering. 
scattering of the powder in a selective manner using the laser. So what is meant by this selective manner here? That is as per the CAD design. Okay, so it can be like in any particular layer you want this kind of a shape and in some other layer you want this type of shape. So that is a selective, uh, uh, selective centering. Okay. Now, this uh, on the left is shown is a schematic of uh, your select SLS or selective laser centering machine. So this also uses a laser source which can be a CO2 laser generally, say CO2 laser. Then uh, we have uh, some infrared heaters as well. We have IR heaters here. Okay, now this CO2 laser uh, projects the laser onto these uh, X and Y scanning uh, mirrors. So these X and Y scanning mirrors, they provide motion using galvanometers. Okay, they control the motion using galvanometers. Okay, then we have this laser beam which is focused and adjusted. And this is the powder bed where our uh, product is being formed. Now these feed cartridges they act as the input. Okay, and uh, this is the counter rotating powder leveling roller. So whenever we have to uh, feed the material into the system, these kind of move up, and these roller uh, tend to uh, spread out a uniform a layer of uniform thickness. So these rollers spread out a layer of uniform thickness onto the powder bed. Okay. Now what are these IR heaters used for? They uh, basically they are used for preheating the powder bed okay for preheating so why is this preheating required this is required uh, to any kind of sharp thermal gradients and hence the re thermal residual stresses. So why are these required? Uh, because uh, when laser source strikes the powder, uh, it has very high temperatures. So uh, such a steep, uh, from room temperature to such higher temperatures can create very sharp thermal gradients and such sharp thermal gradients can eventually lead to uh, very uh, high residual stresses uh, within the uh, part or the manufactured component. So we want to avoid such residual stresses. So for that purpose, we uh, preheat this powder so that it attains a certain temperature. And uh, when the laser source strikes on this powder, the temperature gradients are not very high. Okay, okay. so this will uh, avoid any kind of uh, sharp thermal stresses or gradients, okay. So what is the working principle? It basically consists of uh, three stages. Okay, three main stages. Firstly, a layer of powder is spread. As a, that uh, these counter rollers, they uh, spread a layer of uniform thickness. Okay, this should have uniform thickness. Okay, which can be 0.1 mm thick maybe. Now, 
Each layer is preheated before scanning to minimize the heat input from the laser. Okay, one reason is to minimize the heat input from the laser. Okay, so suppose your bed is already at somewhat 200 degrees Celsius and you have to uh, reach, uh, say, uh, you have to reach, uh, suppose, 1000 degrees. So it is, uh, it will uh, minimize the heat input from uh, 200 to 1000. You require only 800 degrees Celsius. But if it was to go from room temperature, say, 20 degrees to 1000 degrees, so it would have required 980 degrees Celsius. So that way heat input has been minimized. So one reason is this. Another reason is to uh, uniform uh, to have a uniform bed temperature which prevents warpage of the parts. Okay. So if the temperature of the bed is already uniform, you, you will not be having any kind of sharp thermal gradient. So it will uh, prevent you from having uh, steep uh, residual thermal stresses and hence the warpage of the parts. Now, you uh, once you have a powder layer, you have preheated it. Now you uh, strike the radiations onto the powder and, uh, the, and direct uh, the laser in such a way as it resembles the CAD file. Okay, so that it just uh, radiates uh, only at the points as directed by the CAD file and you have the powder solidified only at uh, specified places. So you have your part. Now, when a particular layer has solidified, your elevator platform drops through a distance, whatever is equal to the layer thickness. And then again, this powder layer is spread and uh, laser is uh, radiated. Okay. Now, typically some cool down period is required uh, so that uh, whatever parts uh, you have uh, made, they uniformly come down to a lower temperature. So once your entire part is printed, uh, you allow some cool down period. If you uh, just uh, take off uh, your part from the printer immediately, it will again go through sh uh, sharp thermal gradients because inside uh, that machine, the temperature is really high and outside you have uh, room temperature. So that is low. So there will be sharp uh, thermal gradients, which will again cause a warpage. Now, if the parts are prematurely exposed to the ambient temperature, the powder may degrade as well because in the presence of O2, your powder will be at higher temperature obviously and at higher temperature, components are highly reactive to form their oxides, metals specifically. They are highly susceptible to formation of oxides and hence the parts can warp or curl due to uneven thermal contractions because your Oxide, metal oxide and metal, they do not have similar thermal characteristics. Now, uh, we have certain powder fusion mechanisms. Okay. Uh, so, what is powder fusion basically? Powder fusion refers to your sintering. Excuse me. Okay, so what is sintering? It is uh, basically a joining of two particles or two powder particles, okay, Be because of some thermal sources, okay. Uh, whenever you have some kind of thermal sources, they induce fusion between the powder particles. Now, this sintering occurs at elevated temperatures but below the melting temperatures. Okay. occurs at elevated temperatures but below the melting temperature of the component. So it occurs usually between uh, one half of the absolute melting temperature and the melting temperature. So, if your melting temperature is say 1000, so it will occur between 500 and 1000. Okay. And uh, what is the primary mechanism? It is diffusion between the powder particles. So, whenever there is diffusion between the powder particles, we say sintering is happening. So, we have four mechanisms for this. One is solid state sintering, 
then chemically induced sintering liquid phase sintering or partial melting and then full melting so first is a solid state sintering so here we have these unsintered powder particles so are your unsintered powder particles okay so these are currently having high, uh, higher surface area okay now here is the pore this is your pore okay uh, the, uh, so now what is the driving force driving force is the minimization of total free energy of the powder particle okay and uh, so higher the surface area to volume ratio higher will be the driving force okay so a higher surface area to volume ratio means smaller particles okay now this is having certain driving force now these will tend to diffuse this is your pore now material will flow from these ends towards this so and it will form a neck so this is necking so diffusion is happening so material is flowing and the pore closes so this pore is reduced in size now this is pore reduced in size okay now here diffusion has happened and it continues to happen further okay so please understand that this pore cannot be eliminated completely now uh, whenever it has reached a minimum total free energy this diffusion will stop okay now this has lower surface area the surface area has reduced as the surface area reduces so does the driving force hence driving force also reduces this implies diffusion stops and as the diffusion stops your sintering also stops so now uh, what is this uh, how is this surface area related to energy so this is your total surface energy which is equivalent to surface energy per unit area and the surface area so higher the surface area higher will be the surface energy and it will tend to minimize the energy okay so everything works in such a fashion so as to minimize the energy everything wants to stabilize itself by minimizing the energy so when we have higher surface area to volume ratio driving forces are higher so what does this mean smaller particles will have higher driving force and hence they will sinter rapidly and at lower temperatures that is why we see that nanoparticles are easy to center in uh, with respect to the uh, microparticles now we have next is a chemically induced a uh, sintering so this makes use of a thermally activated chemical reaction between two types of powders to form a by product which binds the powder particles together okay now this by product it actually acts as a glue between your powder particles now this is usually used for ceramic materials because they are very high at a melting temperature and sintering temperature as well so uh, we uh, it is not easy to attain such high temperatures so we usually go by the process of creating a by product which will just hold on to all the particles together for example a laser processing of silicon carbide in presence of oxygen 
which forms uh, SiO2 and this SiO2 helps to bind the silicon carbide particles by forming a composite. Now next we have a uh, liquid phase sintering or a uh, partial melting. Name suggests we have a bit uh, melting of the particles as well. So this consists of a mixture of powder particles having two types of powders. One is a low melting uh, temperature binder particle and another is your high melting original uh, constituent which was your major part. Okay, so this uh, low melting temperature binder particles, they act as additives. So they are the additives here. Now, whenever a uh, laser will strike, temperature will rise. So when temperature will rise, obviously the one that is having a low melting temperature will melt first. Okay, so uh, what happens is now your low melting temperature uh, powder, it has gone to the molten state, but your actual constituent uh, powder, say titanium, uh, your component is to be made of titanium. So your titanium is still a solid. So that uh, the powder that has gone into the molten form, it will just penetrate through all the available spaces and pores and solidify there. And it will act as a glue to hold down the powder particles together. Okay, so uh, in both chemically induced sintering and liquid phase sintering, we have another pa uh, particle which uh, acts as a glue and holds down the particles together. But the difference is in chemically induced sintering, we have a chemical reaction that produces the secondary kind of byproduct. Whereas in liquid phase sintering, we knowingly add a low melting temperature particle. So liquid phase, uh, in liquid phase sintering, we have certain variations which are separate particles, composite particles, coated particles and indistinct mixture. So what is separate particles? So separate particles is basically we are having a group of uh, your main constituent and certain uh, here this is green one is low melting temperature particles so they are mixed together randomly okay now we have composite particles so here the particles are in the form of composites okay so suppose these are your particles so these are not just a single material but composites so these will contain the low melting phase within them only okay so this is inside them these are your composite particles now next comes the coated particles so suppose these are your particles and you have a coating of these low melting temperature uh, part, uh, phase are on them. So this is the coating. So as this coating melts, it penetrates through all the available spaces and goes down to the solid particles. And then this is an indistinct mixture, which is basically of alloy or something. Now the last one is full melting. This is uh, usually used uh, for engineering metal alloys and semi-crystalline polymers. Okay, here uh, the powder particles are melted completely uh, below the individual layer thickness to fuse them together. Now what is meant by the term below the individual layer thickness to fuse them together? That means the melting is done in such a way that not only that particular layer, the current layer uh, melts but a part of the previously solidified layer also melts okay so suppose this is your current layer that is being printed and this is your previous layer so whenever the laser will strike this particular layer will melt completely, but partial melting, some part of this 
also nails to ensure good fusion between both the layers why this is happening to ensure good fusion between both the layers and for the same reason suppose this has been scanned first now this is the second track and this is the third track so and for the same reason to ensure good bonding a part of first track is melted uh, whenever the second track is being uh, formed and a part of second track is melted whenever the third track is being formed okay so the materials that can be used for this are polymers metals and their alloys that can be titanium stainless steel cobalt chromium alloy and many other alloys so and also uh, we had gone through certain specifics of certain different types of machines using different lasers like electron beam lasers gamma rays x rays etc so but the basic concept and ideology of all the uh, machines remain the same now uh, let us come uh, to uh, the some of the sample problems for this course okay there are some 10 problems and we'll go through them one by one so first is photopolymerization process makes use of liquid radiation curable resins or photopolymers as their primary materials true or false this is true we we saw that photopolymerization process which is a polymerization induced uh, by radiation uv light or uh, radiation of photons polymerization induced by the presence of radiations so we have radiation curable resins that is the resins that can be cured using radiation or photopolymers polymers that react to the presence of photons so the answer is true now question number 2 dash is a polymer that changes its properties when exposed to light often in ultraviolet or visible region of electromagnetic spectrum heat polymer photopolymer electropolymer or none of these so going by the names of each one of these so heat polymer would probably responds to the presence of heat or high temperature photopolymer this would responds to the presence of photons now what is meant by photons photons is basically light which is uv or visible usually and then is electropolymers which uh, may respond to some electro sig uh, electrical signals or electromagnetic signals or etc so we are not concerned with that our major concern is this photopolymer so correct answer is photopolymer as they would respond to light often in ultraviolet or uv spectrum now question number 3 photo curable resins can be used in dentistry true or false the answer is they can be used in uh, dentistry they are usually used in uh, dentistry for making certain coatings over the teeth to seal the cavities so as to prevent any foreign material
any foreign material going into the cavities so since uh, this is being used in dentistry dentistry uv rays are harmful for humans so usually visible light spectrum photopolymers are used that respond to visible light they are majorly used now question number 4 which of the following radiations can be used to cure commercial photopolymers gamma rays x rays electron beams or all of these so all of these can be used to cure commercial photopolymer be it gamma rays or x rays or electron beam it is just that ultraviolet and visible are more commonly used so this doesn't mean that others cannot be used they can be used so moving on to next question question 5 dash is also called as layer wise approach that irradiates entire layer at one time two photon vector scan mask projection or none of these so let us uh, once again go back to the basics of all the three techniques so in two photon approach we had two lasers is radiating the laser at a one point where the polymer used to cure so we can say this is a point wise approach okay so two photon approach is a point wise approach now we go to vector scan in vector scan also this laser it uh, passes through the scanning galvanometers and scans in a point wise manner so it moves from every one point to the other as it moves in x and y direction so it is also a point wise approach now let us come to mask projection in mask projection technique we have laser and uh, then this is your laser and then we have this dmd here and then it goes to the resin tank wherein because of this dmd it uh, projects the entire layer at once okay so we can say that this is a layer wise approach since each layer is being projected at once this becomes a layer wise approach so the correct answer is mass projection technique now moving on to next question question 6 which of the following processes uses scanning galvanometer vector scan approach mass projection approach two photon approach or all of these so if we check what we had seen in the last question these two photon approach and vector scan approach they use scanning galvanometers but this mask projection it uses dmd or what is called as digital micro mirror devices okay so the correct answer to this question will be vector scan approach and 
two photon approach mass projection approach uses this uses digital micro mirror devices moving on to seventh question vector scan and two photon approaches does not require any type of scanning laser beam this is false so if there is no scanning laser beam how will the photopolymers polymerize without any beam you cannot polymerize any laser uh, photopolymer so you require a beam question 8 approaches that avoid recoating are faster and uh, less complicated approaches that avoid recoating so this is false approaches that require recoating are faster and less complicated they can be done easily next question is uv curable photopolymers are used as photoresist in the uh, micro electronics industry uv curable photopolymers are used as photoresist in the micro electronics industry this is true this was given in the lectures content as well and moving on to the last question which of the following type of lasers are used in sla250 system this is a question particularly based on one type of system that was discussed during the lecture and the answer to this one is helium cadmium laser okay so these were the questions for uh, today i hope uh, they were clear to everyone and uh, if you guys have any doubt you can raise them up okay uh, or else you can always post in discussion forums okay so these uh, videos and ppts will be available to you uh, through google drive links and youtube links hope to see you in next session as well thank you